want to thank Gwen for that introduction and, and thank the choir for that music. And particularly my little Joya who came to Oakland thinking she was an alto. And I would not let her remain as such. <laughs> and so you see what we have. I want to congratulate all of you for convening this conference on music. And I regret that I couldn't attend all of the sessions because I'm certain I would have benefited greatly from all of the, my fellow consultants. I'm certainly delighted with Ricky Little. Um, I tell people that not only was I his teacher, but he lived with me for his final year at Oakwood. I had this habit of keeping senior boys in my home. And Ricky was there with Donald Bentley. And uh, I grew very close to him, of course, and it's from my house that he went off to graduate school. I'm the one that got him ready to go into the big world. <laughs> Not his own mother, but me. So that's my product there. Well, it's good to see so many of my former choir members and fellow Washingtonians. I see Dolores back there and her husband. Hello. My cousin's here. And uh, it's just good to be here, former students. And when I, I know that I'm speaking um, on a subject that, about which there's such diversity of opinion. I want you to know that as I speak this morning, I've got a backup team in Atlanta praying for the success of this meeting. I've been brought here this morning to discuss with you music for the worship of God. Before I plunge into the message, however, please let me trace for you my musical roots so that you will be able to see the way in which I have been shaped. And perhaps this story will furnish some insights into the beliefs I now hold. Strange that Ricky would, be, would end with tracing his roots. I'm beginning that way and we did not communicate. I am the granddaughter of a slave, Lewis Montgomery, a man who never learned to read and write. As a slave boy, he worked in the home of his owner, and his mistress could see that he was a very bright boy, and she longed to teach him to read. However, the law of the land forbade slaves to read. Being musical, she compromised and taught my grandfather to read music by solfeggio, those Italian syllables that say do, re, mi, fa, etc. And he became a master at it. Whenever we used to have song fests, when we'd gather around the, uh, the piano in the evenings, I'd be playing, my daddy on the bass, my grandpa on the tenor, my sister on the soprano, and mama on the alto. Grandpa was never the one to make mistakes. And he was singing do, re, mi, he couldn't read the words. In time, freedom came. Grandpa married and worked as a sharecropper. In all, he and my grandmother had 14 children. My father, James Montgomery, was the second of those. Aside from farm chores in the culture of that home, Grandpa taught music to all of his children. It was the only formal learning that he had to pass on. My father, was the only one of the 14 children to break away and seek an education. His parents had no money, so he had to work his way through school with a variety of jobs. He learned to play the bass violin, and that bass violin put him through Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. At that time, a school maintained by the Presbyterian Church for the education of young black men only. Daddy would play for dances and shows and jazz orchestras. A solid summer of work on the boardwalk of Atlantic City would give him a, a year's tuition. So it was that he graduated from Lincoln University in the year 1907 at the age of 24. It took him a while since he had no help. Still playing in jazz bands at night, he entered Howard University School of Law. And in time, he married my mother. One summer, when he was touring with a jazz orchestra, an elderly deacon from First Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Washington, Brother Henry Jackson, came through their neighborhood offering to give Bible studies to the families. My family accepted his offer and became persuaded of the truth of the message he presented. So my mother wrote to my father 
and told him of her plan to be baptized in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. When my father came home, he wrestled with the wisdom of her decision, and employing the research skills he had learned in college, he studied daily at the Library of Congress downtown to prove my mother's newfound faith wrong. But he couldn't do it. He read himself right into the truth. <laughs> They have described to me the day that he joined. My mother and her aunt, and her aunt was Mrs. Pinky Jenkins. Some of you know the name Fitzgerald Jenkins in Adventist circles. I was born in his home. His mother was my aunt. They were sitting in church and didn't even know daddy was there. And when the call was made, he walked forward, bringing all that body of research that he had done, put those papers on the altar and join the church. Amen. As he made his decision, he felt that he had to sever from the jazz orchestra. When he went to his employers to resign, they thought he was posturing for a raise. So they raised his salary three times before he was able to convince him that he was to them that he was walking away from them jobless because of his recently dis discovered religious faith. Now, my father was an educated man. He had his degree from Lincoln, and by this time, three years of law school at Howard. So he found work right at Howard University until he entered the public school system in the year of my birth. Our home was full of music. I was born in 1921, and Daddy had bought a big trophy, that relic, an antiquated forerunner of the photograph and the stereo. The only records he bought were classical. Big, thick records with grooves on only one side. You see, I, I come from ancient times. And with raised letters saying RCA Victor on the back. I'm certain you've never seen such things. Both my sister and I were born with musical abilities, it seems. Music, the piano in particular, became for us another toy. Of course, our parents obtained teachers for us and flooded our home with sheet music for us to explore. I was in the fourth grade when my father brought the first radio into the home. Up until then, the only music I heard was the classical music of those records, the music of the church, my piano lessons, the songs I'd learned in school, and the recitals of Roland Hayes and a few other artists. Although I was now hearing popular music and found myself able to reproduce it on the piano keyboard, the twig had already been bent, and I was hooked on classics. One day when we were big girls, my father spoke to both of us and said, I am so glad that I came out of the theater. I couldn't foresee that my children would be so musical, but if I had stayed in the theater, you girls would have had a natural inroad into the world of entertainment, and I wouldn't recommend that life for any girl. Friends, why am I telling you this story? What is the point that I am being? I am the child of a man who played jazz for his living. When he discovered the truth of God, he gave up his position in the jazz field. He even stopped listening to jazz, providing, on the other hand, the finest of music in his home. He turned away from that music completely. Was he wrong to do so? Was my father a foolish man to give up all that money and to change his occupation and lifestyle? I ask the question because today this church, this same church with the same doctrines that Daddy learned, has opened its doors to elements of jazz and rock and roll and has brought this music right into our worship services not only that, but many of our young adults today raised in this church and educated in our schools have decided to ply their talents in the world of entertainment in the name of the Lord as they praise him, they say, in jazz and rock and roll. It is difficult for me, the daughter of a man who made his living in this medium and who forsook it for the cause of Christ, to understand how others who are already in the church can reach out and embrace it, some making their livelihoods with it, and others insisting that we worship God this way. 
That's my problem today. And I ask you to consider it as we further develop our study. My subject is music for the worship of God. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I've come with a message that I believe you have given me. This is such a controversial subject. And yet music was created by thee for thy glory. I pray that thou wouldst give the people receptive hearts to hear what I'm going to say. And that you would help me to deliver it in a way that some, it, it may have some effect. Oh Lord, you have said that your word does not come back to you void. And so I do pray that that will be the case this morning. And that there will be some people who will be convinced of the worth of this message. In the worthy name of Jesus who alone is worthy, I do pray. Amen. The status of music in our church today is confused indeed. There was never a problem with music when I was growing up, but today people seem not to know what is proper worship for, music for worship. There's a wide variety of practices going on because everyone is doing as he pleases. Some Adventist churches have several choirs while others have none. The services of some churches are enhanced by fine organs, while others are led by a piano, an electric guitar, and a set of drums. Some choirs sing only gospel music, others sing only anthems, and some sing both. Some churches enjoy the leadership of trained personnel, while the music of other churches is led by people who cannot read a single note of music. Whereas gospel rock is predominant in the black churches, our sister white churches are being inundated with country music. And I suppose all of this confusion is understandable because we have not been given any substantive leadership from the General Conference on the subject of music for the worship of God as the new music arose. Amen. Let me give you a case in point. Some years ago when I was teaching at Oakwood College, it became apparent that the rhythmic gospel choirs were sweeping the black Adventist churches. So the General Conference went into shock and convened an ad hoc committee of black ministers and black musicians to deal with this problem in the black church. We met at Andrews University. To give authenticity to what I'm saying, I will name some of the people who served on that committee. Dr. Benjamin Reeves, Elder Charles Dudley, Dr. Michael Harris, Shelton Kilby, Walter Artes, the late Eleanor Wright, and Alma Blackman. We did a masterful piece of work with the problem that I could tell you about at another time and made several recommendations to the General Conference Music Committee. It so happened that at that time, I was also a member of the General Conference Music Committee. So I was here in Washington when our work was presented. They expressed amazement at the quality of our work. Well, this is certainly more than I expected to come out of that committee, said one white person. Another said, we need these recommendations for the white churches too. And they did not enact a single suggestion claiming the inability to fund the pilot study that we had proposed. We admitted that we had a problem. The music of the black church was changing. The former solemnity of the black church service was disappearing because the new music inspired modes of behavior that had never been seen in church service before. People were now clapping throughout the music, stomping their feet, yelling at the singers, sing your song. Well, they won't do that whether you yell it or not. Go on, girl, that's all right. Congregations were now responding to every vocal wiggle and wobble that the singers would make with the ooh. Oh, you can hear that sound just going on. You hear it all the time right now, don't you? You're probably a part of it. It was obvious that the emphasis was on the performer's ability to thrill rather than on the redeemer about whom one was singing. Elder John Hancock, who at that time was chairman of the General Conference Music Committee and came to the ad hoc committee, 
shared with us the following experience from Selected Messages by Ellen G. White. And Ricky has read it to you this morning about the camp meeting in Muncie, Indiana, and how Elder Haskell, a name well known in denominational history, had spoken at the 11 o'clock service as the General Conference representative and about the unusual musical performances that had taken there, dominated by Holy Flesh, one of the offshoot groups that arise from time to time within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And when Elder Haskell left that meeting, he wrote two letters to Ellen White about it. And in his second letter, he said that the music had caused a division in the church, that there were people who had stopped coming to the services because they said they simply could not worship God in that way. And you know what Sister White's response was, because it was read to you this morning. These things that you have described as taking place in Indiana, the Lord has shown me. Now, Sister White was our church's prophet for these last days in which we live. And when she says, the Lord has shown me, that's about as direct a message as we are going to get. Amen. And we had better listen. Amen. The Lord has shown me would take place just before the end of probation. The senses of rational beings will become so confused that they can't be trusted to make right decisions and will be called the working of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit never reveals itself in such methods, in such a bedlam of noise. She went ahead to talk about it being an invention of Satan to, to just dispel the truth. She said the powers of Satan's agencies blend with the din and noise to have a carnival. Now, if you can believe something else that she wrote, that there were demons at the cross that began the, crawl, the cry, crucify him. There were demons at Jesus' uh, trial. Crucify him, they said, and the people took up the chant. Then you had better believe they're here with us when we're committing all this whoop de do in the name of the Lord. She said to have a carnival. I don't know whether you've ever been in a carnival, but I've been in one. I was down there at Oakwood College teaching and I missed, they, they have something at the end of every freshman orientation week called, I don't know whether they still do it or not, called the Freshman Follies. Do they still do it, Ricky? Sometimes. Because let me tell you, after I went to one of those Follies, I wrote a letter to Dr. Rock about the Follies. And he stopped them. They called it, they still had it, but they called it something else. Because see, I sat there, everything they sang was religious. They think since Oakwood's a church school, you gotta be religious all the time. They even skate to religious music. You just gotta be religious all the time. But oh my grief, what religion? Anyway, I went to this carnival. I'm calling it a carnival because I was late and I sat on one of those seats in Moran Hall by the wall, just a single folding chair. And as the music went on, there was a little girl from Pine Forge up on stage singing, and one of our upper class women, named Michelle, was playing for her. And there came, you know how repetitive gospel music is, there came a time in that piece where Michelle would reach her hand to the farthest extremity of the bass, and her right hand to the farthest extremity of the treble, and she would just tickle. And as she did, she drew her body like this, and all this in the front was moving. And so the kids would just go crazy. <laughs> and so a girl who was sitting behind me stood up in her chair, and she screamed so. I looked around at her and said, young woman, because she was making me deaf, but she never heard me. She just kept on screaming. Then people decided that that number was so hot that the pianist needed to be cooled off. So they went running up front with pieces of Kleenex and fanned the pianist. Then they'd streak back to their seats. Oakwood College, you all. If ever a carnival was held, that was it. And that little girl could hardly be heard standing on that stage. Yes, she was singing a song about Jesus. But that was it. That was the setting. As Ricky told you this morning, the music overrides the words. Sister White said, the Holy
Holy Spirit has nothing to do with such a confusion of noise and multitude of sounds as passed before me last January. I was instructed to say, who instructed her, you all? I was instructed to say that at these demonstrations, demons in the form of men are present, working with all the ingenuity that Satan can employ to make the, church, the truth disgusting to sensible people. He makes the effect of this music like the poison sting of the serpent. Now, the serpent is a familiar animal to Satan. Isn't that the form that he took in the Garden of Eden? And he got into a tree that was so he could tempt Eve and Adam to eat of the knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of what? What did you say? And now Sister White uses that serpent to say, to discuss, to, or rather to describe the music. He's tempting us again with a mixture of what? Good words to evil music. The serpent. And when she prophesied, those things which have been in the past will be in the future. Clear and definite instruction has been given in order that all may understand, but the itching desire to originate something new results in strangeness. Now, that excerpt that Ricky played this morning brought tears to my eyes as I sat over there. The tears popped out of my eyes because the young man who created that was my piano student. And I thought about the itching desire to create something new. I thought about these words of Ellen White's. Just before the close of probation, Ellen G. White has passed away, but her prophecy has come true. We are living in the time of the end, just before the close of probation. And that music about which she prophesied with all of its attendant behaviors is here. Well, according to Ellen G. White, God doesn't like it. Why then do we insist upon this musical Babylon, this mixture of good and evil, this singing of sacred words to satanic dance music? Why? I have no objection to a gospel song, per se. I like gospel songs. I do object to the style of music in which we present sacred words. The beat that we use in the church today is the same beat that entertainers use in their rock and roll performances. We have mixed rock and roll with heavenly themes, and we don't even know what rock and roll is. I'm going to teach you this morning, though. After today, you will know. Listen to this excerpt from a Memphis daily newspaper. Rock and roll, the rebellion is fundamental. From the very beginning, rock and roll was meant to be a form of rebellion. Rebellion against society, government, and parents who were shocked at Elvis Presley's rocking pelvis. Rock and roll is more than just a concert or a pop song on the Top 40 Countdown. It is sexual, spiritual, and controversial. Now ask any good Seventh-day Adventist to define rebellion, and the automatic response will come. Rebellion is the breaking of the law of God. From this, one can see the obvious contradiction in the term gospel rock. How can you present the good news of salvation in a rebellious, law-breaking format? More about the definition of rock and roll. And I guess, I'm sorry, children are here, but it's okay. I'm glad I'm not in the church. I'm in Tacoma Academy for which my daughter graduated, so I'd be afraid to say what I'm going to say in church. This comes from the Los Angeles Weekly columnist Michael Ventura. He is a musicologist. He doesn't care anything about our soul salvation. This man is just writing on the history of music. And his hypothesis is that all American music comes from Africa. And more about that later, but for right now, Listen to what he says. Rock and roll is a word from the depths. Each of its parts 
is both a noun and a verb. As a noun, rock refers to something hard, which as a verb moves back and forth, oscillating. Roll as a noun refers to something sweet and soft, which as a verb can move and never stop, rolling on and on past infinity. He says in the jukeboxes of the South, rock and roll did not mean the name of a music. It meant to commit the sex act. And when the disc jockeys played rock around the clock tonight in the mid 50s, the meaning hadn't changed. The gospel of salvation presented in the sex act? I have another article from the 1982 issue of Ebony Magazine, which says of Andre Crouch and his music, Crouch certainly didn't stick to the traditional format of presenting religious music. When Crouch combined his presentation with the more commercial style of songwriting, he carved a niche for himself in the music world that is usually reserved for non-religious artists. This way, Crouch has cleverly combined elements of disco, progressive jazz, rhythm and blues, pop, and even rock, while at the same time walking a fine line between his traditional grassroots gospel background and outright top 40 funk. Do these words sound as if we're talking about sacred music? No. Yet in Black Adventist churches all across the country this very day, because of our tendency to copy gospel tapes and records, our choirs are performing in the 11 o'clock worship services, disco, progressive jazz, just because the words are sacred, rhythm and blues, pop and rock, and I am not afraid to say in any company, and I said it up there to Andrews in that ad hoc committee, though a lot of good it did, that this awful practice should be eradicated from our church. The practice of imitating the unholy styles from the recordings of gospel artists whose primary purpose is not to save souls, but to sell their wares. Some of us contend that we are expressing our blackness when we rock our sacred music. That this music is our heritage as blacks. I strongly disagree. A heritage is something that is handed down from one generation to another. And this music is rising up all around us and is therefore contemporary. Our heritage as blacks is the Negro spiritual. Amen. Our forefathers did not have houses and lands and large amounts of money to give to us. Our legacy is music. And just as my grandfather taught music to his 14 children, the, those unknown slave forebears of ours, faceless, nameless creatures of the past, left to us hundreds of Negro spirituals, <coughs> from that awful, toilsome period of slavery. And we would do well to recognize that fact and to value our inheritance and to keep it alive. However, there is a relationship between these musical forms that I have mentioned and Africa. Let me tell you about it. This is from Michael Ventura, the musicologist. I use the word top 40 funk. I'm going to speak African now, never been there. Funk comes from the Kikongo language. The word is lufuki. It means sweat. I shall speak of soul music in a minute. Soul comes from the Kikongo language. The word is mojo. Translated, it means invested with the spirit power, with the ability to influence, cure, or heal. It is a voodoo practice in Africa right today to carry a mojo stone. There is a music called boogie. It comes from the Kikongo language, mbugi, M-B-U-G-I. Translated, it means devilishly good. Juke, as in jukeboxes, is derived from the Mandakan language. Translated, it means bad. And Michael Ventura says jukeboxes and southern dives meant bad music played by bad people in bad places. Jazz. Jazz comes from the Kikongo. The word is dinza. 
Translated, it means to ejaculate. Now, I can see that they have to have a word for that bodily function. But I maintain that it doesn't have to provide the framework for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I hope you see what an abomination we are playing around with. Friends, Africa was not a Christian nation. And although many denominations have been working there for years and years, it still is not totally converted. Voodoo practices persist there in the motherland. And those same voodoo practices travel to Haiti and to New Orleans, where they formed the basis for the American music that arose in the South, jazz and rock and roll. So even though we are African Americans, we have to choose what parts of our heritage we can value as Christians. We cannot take the whole thing. I have been maintaining for years, and I wish you all could see these pictures that I have here of these Africans in possession, possessed by another spirit. And I wish you could read, I wish you could read all that this man has had to say about how the drummer controls what God is being called up by the drums in Africa and how they can all detect what God has entered into the person as they come dancing forward, wearing the God on their backs as it were. I wish you could read it. It's scary, it's frightening, but it's true because it's based on the research of this musicologist. I have been maintaining for years that what we have done has been to adopt the music of the Pentecostal Church. In preparation for a speech that I made at Atlantic Union College last year, I consulted Rhodes Dictionary of Music, which is the major source of information on music and musicians. There I found support for my thesis on page 554. This gospel rock music is not blackness, according to Grove, but Pentecostalism, listen to this, Gospel music is a religious type of folk or popular music, and its performing style is related to secular folk and popular types, as well as to revivalist styles of preaching and praying. It is principally American and is performed by both blacks and whites. Among blacks, gospel music has largely replaced spirituals. What a shame. Black gospel is related to the development of the Pentecostal and Holiness churches. Since the 1940s, gospel music has been assimilated into the church services of many denominations. It has also become closely associated with certain popular styles. Black gospel with soul music, remember Mojo? And white gospel with country music. While the foundation of black gospel music was laid in the white gospel tradition, when I read that, I wanted to laugh. That black gospel music, I got to do this because I'm black that it came from white people. <laughs> Let me read that again. While the foundation of black gospel music was laid in the white gospel tradition, its functions in black culture soon led it to assume a character of its own. The appearance of black gospel music coincided with the beginnings of ragtime, blues, and jazz. It coincided also with the rise of the Pentecostal churches at the end of the 19th century where the services were characterized by the gift of speaking with tongues. Members of the congregation uttered pronouncements in unknown languages while in a hysterical, hypnotic, or translate state and were accompanied by a new type of ecstatic service. The term shouting, Grove's Dictionary says, applies to the ecstatic singing and dancing accompanied by hand clapping that are a feature of gospel services, which frequently end in the dancers being overcome by spirit possession. Remember Mojo? Characteristic of the holiness and sanctified churches in which the dancing and exaltation take place in the church aisles. Such extravagant possession leads to jerking, rhythmic movements, babbling, involuntary cries, and perspiring, there's that word, lufuki, sweat, before succumbing to the trance. Sheets are often laid out for those whom the Holy Spirit has thus entered. And such churches have been nicknamed Holy Row. Of these, the most significant musically is the Church of God in Christ. 
Now this is the same worship style about which Ellen G. Wright wrote in 1900. Dancing, exultation, jerking, rhythmic movements, shaking, people lying on the floor in an amalgam of arms and legs. Oh friends, this has no place in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But we have adopted the music of the Pentecostal Church, which is designed by its repetitive phrases and strong rhythms to work people up to a fevered pitch so that they become possessed and speak in tongues. I fear that if we keep on playing around with this medium, that we may slip over that fine line which now divides us from that church and little by little accept the whole worship style. Oh no, that'll never happen, you say. Well, back in 1950, I didn't think that what we were doing now would happen. Nothing stands still. Movements are progressive. We have to be careful. Music for the worship of God. Who is he anyway that he should be particular about how, about how he is worshipped? Who is this God whom we seek to worship? He is the three in one, the triune God. The Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He is the creator of the universe. He created all life. He created you and me. He is the omnipotent one, having all power. He is the omniscient one, knowing everything. Who is God? He is love. I did not say that he loves us, although he does. I said he is love. I didn't say that he is loving, although he is. I said he is love. He is the very embodiment of that attribute, something that you and I can never be. Who is God? He is the righteous judge, the one before whom we all must stand to give an account of these deeds done in our bodies. Yet, he is the fount of mercy, the one to whom we pray for guidance, for help, for strength, for healing, and for forgiveness of our sins. Who is God? He is the Savior of the world, who in heavenly councils, before the foundation of the world, offered himself to be a living sacrifice for man. And when we became embroiled in the great controversy between Christ and Satan, between good and evil, there it is again. He, our creator, came to earth and suffered that cruel death on the cross to redeem us back unto himself. Now resurrected and living on high, he stands be beside his Father and pleads for us as we pray for forgiveness. Who is God? He is the Ancient of Days, ruler of the universe, seated today on his throne and surrounded by beings who bow before him continually and say, Holy, 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 receiving praise that never stops. Yes, holy is he, and worthy of our praise. And when we come before him in the worship relationship, we are his humble subjects. We are not on an equal basis with him, not at all. My choirs and my aeolians have often heard me pray before we go into the service. Dear Father, we have prepared this music with the talents that you've given us. We've done all with it that it is humanly possible for us to do. So we pray that the Holy Spirit will take our rendition, and as he does with our prayers, that he will transform it into a state that will be fit for your ears to hear. Please accept this music as our offering to you, and then let your Holy Spirit give us the inspiration to make these words and notes meaningful to the congregation. I developed this prayer after reading from Ellen White that because of our sins, our music at its best, is discordant to the ears of God. If that is true, why should we plan a lot of hoop to do for him? This is not show-off time, nor is it clever time, nor is it ethnic time. He already knows that we are black. <laughs> we don't have to prove it to him, but we should be praising him that we're black, or that in spite of it, we're getting along. Let me tell you, if Ellen White were here today, she'd write us some notes. 
I have one she wrote to somebody else. You want to hear it? His name was Brother S. I love to read these letters of hers, but she just writes to somebody and gets them told. <laughs> she, by way of introduction, she said, Brother S. has thought that singing was about the greatest thing to be done in this world, and he has a very large and grand way of doing it. That's her comment. Now she says to him, Brother S., your singing is far from pleasing to the angel choir. Imagine yourself standing in the angel band, elevating your shoulders, emphasizing the words, motioning your body, and putting it in the full volume of your voice. What kind of concert and harmony would there be with such an exhibition before the angels? There's something particularly sacred in the human voice. Its harmony and its subdued and heaven-inspired pathos exceeds every musical instrument. Vocal music is one of God's gifts to men, an instrument that cannot be surpassed or equaled when God's love abounds in the soul. Spit singing with the spirit and understanding also is a great addition to devotional services in the house of God. How this gift has been debased when sanctified and refined, it would accomplish great good in breaking down the barriers of prejudice and, and hard-hearted belief and unbelief and would be the means of converting souls. Your voice has been heard in church so loud, so harsh, accompanied or set off with your gesticulations, not the most graceful, that the softer and more silvery strains, more like angel music, could not be heard. You have sung more to men than to God. As your voice has been elevated in loud strains above the congregation, you have been thoughtful of the admiration you were exciting. You really have high ideas of your singing. The love of praise has been the mainspring of your life, and this is a poor motive for a Christian. You have wanted to be petted and praised like a child. You have much to contend with, Brother S. In your own nature, it has been hard work for you to overcome your natural besetments and live a self-denying, holy life. Woo. Ellen G. White. Imagine getting a letter from her. So I ask you, are we really worshiping God? She said that he wasn't. But she, if so, she says, that clear and definite instruction has been given. And the morning's text, Colossians 3.16, told us to render three kinds of music, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, what are they? Years ago, we had Sabbath school lessons on music which defined these three forms. Psalms, the Sabbath school lesson said, that music whose words come directly from the scriptures. That musical form is the anthem. Here we are not limited to the 150 chapters of the Psalms, although they do form the text for many anthems. But an example from somewhere else would be John 3.16, God so loved the world, set to music by John Stanley. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, etc., but have everlasting life. The Lord is my light, my light and my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? The Lord is the strength, the strength of my life. Of whom then shall I be afraid? Right out of the Bible. Lift up your heads, O ye gates and the King of Glory shall come in. Who is this King of Glory? Who is the King of Glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. He is the King of Glory. You know, I did a concert with the Aeolians in, in New York, and uh, it was well received. I mean, we, we had to encore and encore. A boy came to Oakwood after we'd been there, sought me out, came to my office to talk to me. I was at your concert in New York, he said. I said, oh, good. You know, I'm sitting at my desk working. And he said, I didn't like the music. I said, oh, what was wrong with it? Well, it wasn't relevant to me. I said, what's relevant to you? See, he wanted us to come up there from a college now. 
I'm a teacher in a college, and I'm supposed to go around this country stomping. <laughs> he wanted me to come up there and do that religious pop. So I told him that I teach in a college and that it is my responsibility to raise the level of the children's music performance from the way they came, from, from where it was when they came. That's my responsibility. But I said, if you didn't like the pieces that we sang, and you say they're not relevant to you, are, are you a baptized member of the church? Yes. I said, well then, do you mean the scriptures are not relevant to you? Are you telling me that you can take it if the preacher preaches and says a text, but when we sing it, it suddenly becomes irrelevant? That silenced him. Hymns are that form of music in which congregations raise pure praises to God. The emphasis is upon him. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise him, for he is thy help and salvation. All ye who hear, now to his temple draw near, etc. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, at the end, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. And the very first hymn that was ever written, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, written by that same Martin Luther, who nailed those theses on the door of the Catholic Church and started the Reformation. Ricky said this morning that we have students down at Oakwood who don't want to do anything Euro European. And when they say this to me, I say, well, what did you study about how our denomination came to be? When you studied the Reformation, wasn't that European? Did you throw that out? If you, if you can't throw that out, then you can't throw out the music that went along with it. It all started in Europe. Somehow the Lord gives me answers for these Oakwood students. <laughs> Spiritual songs. That form in which the emphasis shifts from God to the person, giving the singer an opportunity to testify of God's intervention upon his life. Examples. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. And he walks with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. Hear all those me's in there? I'm testifying. And the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known. Or the song that Gwen conducts so beautifully with her choir, Just For Me. Just For Me. Just For Me. Just For Me. They pierced him in his side. He hung his head and died. He did all that. Just For Me. In that spiritual songs, I named three different types. The Negro spiritual, one that was in more or less a hymn form, and the other one that is in the form of a gospel song. But if they testify of God's intervention upon the life, of what he's done for you, of, or of what we even expect, if it's riddled with the personal pronoun I, me, we, us, it's a gospel song. See, there's no fault with the gospel song. It's why do we put it in that other framework? In keeping with that text, I recommend this church service in which all three forms appear. Why? Simply because God said to praise him that way. Amen. That's reason number one. And secondly, because such a program of music offers a perfect balance for the service, for the congregation, and for certainly for the choir. The choir should be well-rounded. To sing only one thing is a very, very limiting experience. And I believe that that balance pleases God. In conclusion, I wish to confess that there was a time in my life when I made a safari into gospel music. I'm home, and all of you know when it was. I was the MV leader at the DuPont Park Church and discovered 
that drugs had made an inroad into the ranks of my early teens. In fact, they were sold in the church on a Sabbath day. So upon hearing the music of Edwin Hawkins and finding it attractive, I made friends with him. When I decided I was going to learn gospel music, I went to the king of it. And I used to stand behind Ed and watch his hands, and then when he'd get up, I'd play his music. He says, well, that's what I'm writing, and you, you're learning it before I can record it. Anyway, I copied it and organized my early teens into a gospel choir. I opened my home to these children several times a week for rehearsals and tried hard to take up all their time. I thought that if I had them to memorize these words, they would reflect upon them and, you know, get converted. But my music rocked. And I did not accomplish what I set out to do. My experiment was a failure. Then when I heard Ellen White's prophecy about the rise of wild music just before the close of probation, I realized that I had been a part of the fulfillment of that prophecy. And I confessed my guilt before the Lord. And I stopped. While I am able to play gospel rock, I choose not to. Amen. Like my father, I walked away. Amen. Today I have set that prophecy before you. And since this is the time of the end, we can ill afford to displease God in this matter of music. Why be lost over music? Is it that important to you? I'm going to tell you why we can't get it straight. Satan, who led the heavenly choir, did you know that? Though cast out of heaven, still has his musical ability. And he won't let go. He has always been jealous of Jesus. That's why he was cast out. And when he is crafty enough to influence us to praise Jesus in Satan's music, he's actually waving his baton as he leads us in the music he has inspired. And he laughs at the victory of his deception. Not at you, as much as at Jesus. Don't join him in this mockery of our Savior. But do turn away from this musical Babylon. My father turned away. I turned away. And if it has a grip on anybody out there, you too can turn away like Ricky turned away. In Ezekiel 22, God rebuked ancient Israel and said, your priests have profaned me by mixing the godly and the ungodly. But God also says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. So let us who are here resolve to praise God purely with the beauty of music and in the beauty of holiness. Amen. I thank you for hearing me. Oh. 
The things of earth, they will dim and they will lose their value if we
place to heaven today. Amen. Let us turn in our song sheets as we close our services. We shall sing the first and last stanzas only of hymn number eight in our song sheets. When we all get to heaven.
So we remain standing and bow our heads. Dear Lord and Father, we thank thee for this day. And we ask upon us thy sweet, harmonious, and melodic benediction of peace. Dismiss us from this place, but not from thy presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Just before you leave, we want to remind you that though our divine worship service is concluding now, that we do have a workshop that's going to be presented. It was supposed to be scheduled at 2 o'clock, but we'll give you, shall we say, until 2.20, at best 2.30, all right? You don't want to miss the workshop that Dr. Alma Blackman is going to deliver it for us. You've come this far. So please don't leave. Just take a little few minutes, break, uh, stretch. If by any chance you brought your own lunch for the day, all well and good. If not, stay for Dr. Blackwell, for Dr. Blackwell's presentation. That I'm sure will be your food for this afternoon. God bless you.
I'm gonna speak. I'm gonna say. <laughs> How we do? When and how can I get a compliment? No problem. No problem. Beautiful. All right. <clears throat> Go back. It's not on. 